I'm Frank Olson. I'm a crop economist and marketing specialist with NDSU Extension. Uh, I'm sorry I can't join you today. Uh, unfortunately, I have a meeting conflict and wasn't able to be able to attend the webinar personally, but I'll do my best to try and give you an over, overview and kind of outlook for the 2024 canola market. So here's my contact information. Um, if you do have some questions later on, you'd like to, to contact me and visit about it, I'd be happy to do that. Uh, probably my work cell phone or my email address would be the most reliable to, to try and get a hold of me. So let's just dive right in. Um, one of the things about canola, and in particular canola pricing, is that it really isn't one of the major oil seeds, and I'll go through some kind of background and context. But one of the things that I, uh, I, I've started to watch a little more closely because of some really interesting underlying shifts in the demand base for vegetable oils, and I know D David Ripplinger is going to talk a little bit about the energy markets, kind of what's happening with renewable diesel and kind of the explosion that, that is going on in that environment. And so some of these fundamental shifts now are also changing the way that not only the North American, but also global oil seeds are priced. So in, in the past, I've always kind of mentioned that, well, if you watch what's happening in the Chicago soybean market, it pretty gave you a pretty good idea of what are some of the things going on in the canola market. But in today's world, because of this shift, we really need to be looking at uh, Chicago or the, the futures market for soybean oil, not necessarily for soybeans as the whole soybean, but actually soybean oil. So this chart just is, it's as of the close of the markets on Friday. Um, the black line is the US uh, Chicago soybean oil futures market. Uh, this is the May contract, so it's the nearby contract. And then the blue in the kind of more in the background is the um, ice canola exchange or the, the Winnipeg exchange for canola futures, which is really how most of the crush plants are pricing um, North Dakota uh, canola prices is off of the, the uh, Canadian futures. And as you can see, very tight correlation. We did have a time here in this November time frame when um, the, the uh, canola futures kind of separated a little bit from the soybean oil. Uh, some of that was, of course, some of the pressure that went on during the soybean harvest. But the moral of the story is, you know, even though they have their own little dynamics, these two markets are very, very closely uh, correlated. And so to really understand what's happening in canola, you have to take a step back and kind of get a bigger picture of what's happening in the in the oil market, the vegetable oil market. So with that, let's talk about global vegetable oil production. So when we think globally, Usually, at least here in North America, we always think about soybean oils being the dominant oil seed. But in reality, globally, it's palm oil. And palm oil tends to be priced relatively cheap compared to or lower priced uh, compared to soybeans or rapeseed oil in this case, which is really canola oil. In Europe, they still call it rapeseed or sunflower oil. So when we think about the big production and, and consumption of oil globally, uh, palm oil is actually the largest. And if you'll notice, uh, based on uh, oil production this last year, when we think of this 23, 24 timeframe, um, these are really some very large numbers, even, even some growth over the last couple of years. So from the global perspective, we're seeing an increase in the supply of vegetable oils. And of course, that's putting a little bit of downward pressure on U.S. soybean oil as well, because again, this is, this is priced competitively in the global markets. Now, when we think of actual oil exports, so, you know, that thinking about the tr oil trade, vegetable oil trade, again, palm oil is the largest uh, traded oil. Again, most of that tends to be in the South Asia to North Asia timeframe or, or uh, um, kind of flows. A lot of the palm oil is produced in, in um, Southeast Asia, Malaysia, Indonesia, uh, Japan being uh, Japan and uh, Korea and China being importers, as well as India, importers of palm oil. There's some palm oil that actually makes its way into Europe as well. Um, number two, from a trading volume standpoint, is typically soybean oil. Number three is actually sunflower oil, which I know surprises some people. And then technically number four would be rapeseed oil, where we would call canola oil. So again, there isn't the volume of oil exports but it is influenced because of this competition that goes on in the marketplace. So let's talk about what's happening here in the U.S. canola oil market. 
Now I've taken this from um, some USDA data. Unfortunately, USDA doesn't update their oil minor oil seeds information only about a couple times a year. So this is kind of old data that I got, but it, it gives you a general sense for what's going on in the US soy oil market. Now, again, this is the oil part of it, not the seed. We're gonna get the seed in just a minute. So if you notice, the blue line on the bottom is total oil production. So this is how much soy, uh, canola oil do we actually produce in the United States? And notice that the imports is the red line above it. So if you take the production plus imports, you get the black line, which is total supply. Um, as you can see, we do import a lot of canola oil, the vast majority of that being from Canada, which is no, again, big surprise to anybody because of the size of the canola crop in, in Canada and the relatively large crush capacity that they have in that country. But I just wanted to give you kind of a sense for the relative size and relative importance that yes, we even though we do have oil production, we got crushing capacity here in the US, um, that really the imports in particular from, uh, from Canada to really dominate uh, the, the marketplace. When we look at how does the United States consume oil? Okay, so the blue line on top again is edible oil. So that's packaged and used within food products here in the United States. Um, and then the red line is the biofuel sector. And again, I know Dr. Ripplinger will be talking a little bit about the expansion and some of the changes going on in the biofuel sector. And canola has the, the potential to play a pretty significant role in that marketplace. But again, I just wanna give you an idea right now of kind of the relative size of these. So right now today in the United States, the, the edible oil market is still the dominant portion, although the biofuel sector will likely be uh, growing over time. And just on a sidebar, exports is relatively small, very, very small amount of soy, of uh, canola oil actually leaves the United States. So what about the seeds itself? So the, the canola seed itself here in the US, and we look just at specifically at the US market, um, the blue line is total U.S. production. So again, this is how much how much canola seed we produce. The red line towards the bottom is imports. Now we do import a little bit of of of, of canola seed uh, again, primarily for the crushing sector. And again, when you think about the large crush capacity, largest crushers that we have here in the region, we have the Velva plant, ADM Velva plant, as well as the CHS uh, plant in Hallock, Minnesota, and some of both of those plants do import some seed for crush uh, in from primarily Canada, Canada as well um, into the United States. So, but the largest portion is still domestic use. I mean, domestic uh, production. The blue black line on top is total supply. When we look at canola seed, again, how do we how to use the seed up? It's not a surprise to anybody. The blue line on top is actually the crush. So again, the vast majority of our, so of our canola seed is crushed here within the region. We do have a tiny bit of exports, and I know that surprises people once in a while, but there is a little bit of canola seed flow that goes across the border. Um, there are a couple Canadian, one Canadian company in particular that has some receiving stations in North Dakota. Um, so they buy from local supplies, they'll actually ship it back into Canada to be crushed. So what's the moral of my story is, well, this, this oil seed market in particular canola market actually has a lot of different dimensions. There's things in the international market that have a role to play. There's things domestically that have a role to play. And obviously what happens on the Canadian side of the line because of this relative size of their production has a huge role to play as well. So just again, to, to wrap this into a little bow and to try and put some, some context around it, the green bars represent the amount of soybeans. And again, this would be soybeans coming off the farm um, produced in the United States. The blue bars would be the amount of canola produced in Canada. And the little tiny red bars would be the amount of canola produced in the United States. And so when we think about what are the things that influence prices here in particular in the state, we really need to look outside the state to get, a, get some kind of general direction of what's happening. So I'm going to focus primarily on what's going on in Canada. Now, these are the Canadian uh, StatCan uh, forecast and, uh, as of February 16th. Um, again, they will be coming out with uh, their uh, March updates for their product estimates for production and consumption coming up now in a couple of weeks. Unfortunately, that wasn't available in time for this recording. So just to put uh, some context, I'm, I'm going to focus in on a few specific numbers. 
Um, one of them would be that that when you look at the the this is kind of the supply and demand table. So the top of this uh, table talks about the inflow of canola. The bottom port part talks about the outflow of canola. Um, the column in red on the far right hand side. Uh, StatCan is actually doing some forecasting now for the 24-25 season. So this would be the crop that would be planted this spring. So that's the column in the red hand side. And again, that's going to be a lot of kind of mathematical forecastings based off of from what's typically happening in the marketplace. Column in the middle in blue is from the 23 crop. That's the crop we just got done harvesting. We're in the middle of trying to process and, and get rid of today. The column on the left hand side in green is from two years ago. I'll give you some trends here in just a moment to give you an idea of what's happened historically. So what do, what do we expect to see in, in ending stocks? When we think about ending stocks from two years ago, the 22 crop versus what the current expectation is, a slight increase in that number. And the primary reason, if you notice, it's not necessarily from the crushing demand, and it's not necessarily because of production numbers, it's all because of exports. And that's one of the challenges the Canadians have had now this current marketing year is that the canola exports are a little bit slow. They're a little bit off of last year's pace. When we look forward in time, um, StatCan is, per, is forecasting a slight cutback in acreage. When we put in a trend line yield, it looks though, as though production is expected to be about the same assuming weather cooperates with us, uh, from 23 into 24. When they're looking at crushing demand, they're looking at basically the same numbers, what they're expecting this current year, but they are forecasting a slight rebound or a recovery in the export level. So when we look at what's going on bottom line, we have a little bit higher production, we got a little bit larger consumption, so we're starting to take the forecast for ending stocks down. So if, if the StatCan numbers are correct, you know, this is kind of the current psychology going on the marketplace. It looks as though we're, we're looking at kind of the similar size crop and a similar size ending stocks to the year we just got done harvesting. Okay, so let's look this at this as in historical perspective. The blue line is the amount of crush, uh, basically the amount of canola that's expected to go into the crush sector. Um, the red line is exports and then the black line is kind of everything else to be seed feed and waste. So let's look at the two big uses, the blue line being crushing. Um, I guess a little bit surprising to me, given the fact that we've got some additional crush capacity coming online in Canada, expected in the harvest of 2024. StatCan is currently forecasting to have about the same level of crush. Um, notice the drop now from, from the 2022 into the 23 forecasted, right? And that right now is playing out. So there's about, based on the current export levels, let me look at my numbers specifically, so make sure I got my exact numbers. Um, as of today, um, the, the canola export levels are down about 27% from this time last year. So pretty substantial cutback on their export levels and primarily because the amount of canola going into that um, into the Chinese market has dropped off a bit. And that's the same thing happening in the United States with uh, soybeans. Our soybean exports in, from the US into China are down, mainly because they're buying large, large quantities of Brazilian soybeans. And so what's happening in the oilseed market is now spilling in the soybeans in particular is now spilling over into the canola crop. Based on stat can forecast, they are expecting again, a slight recovery in exports anticipating that the Canadian, the Chinese will likely come back into the marketplace, maybe not at the levels they were before, but looking for uh, a slight recovery in the, uh, in the export market. So who does Canada normally ex export to? Now these are 12 month totals. Um, I was able to find the information for 2023, not a big surprise to anybody. China is the largest user and consumer of Canadian canola. And then we have Japan as number two. Uh, typically, Mexico is number three. Now, the United States is on this list. I didn't have historical data going back, but at least for last year, for last year's numbers, the United States was number four. So that the United States was the fourth largest destination for Canadian canola. So we did pick up the pace a little bit last year relative to the year before. Let's talk a little bit about crush and crushing capacity. Um, this is a map of where the existing crush capacity is. So the dots with the solid filled are existing plants. 
uh, that are currently in operation and the ones with a little red uh, open circles are the ones that are being proposed. Now, one of these has kind of been put on hold. So there's really four facilities that are looking at coming online now in the next couple of years. Two of them um, would be the AGT uh, facility and the Viterra facility are expected to be able to uh, be operational by the harvest of 2024. Okay, now the other two, the current timeline is for probably more like the 2025 harvest season. So they were a little bit further off before they'll come online. Um, there's also some expansions of existing facilities that are going on. So the crush capacity coming out of Canada is expected to, is based on current numbers that I've been able to find, expected to grow to almost 50% in the next couple of years, which is a very, very large increase in crushing capacity. So the question a lot of people ask is, where is that crush capacity going to come from? Where are the extra bushels going to come from or the tons going to come from? And there's really two potential places. Um, one of them is they produce more, they plant more acres. Um, the other is that they start stealing out of the crush capacity or out of the export uh, capacities. So let me go back a couple of slides. So essentially switching some of the, the red line and moving it up into the blue line. And in my opinion, that's probably the more likely case is that we're going to see some of those export levels drop off with the domestic crush becoming a larger portion of the total consumption. And of course, that has some in, in interesting implications for canola here in the United States. So let's look at kind of the forecast for total ending stocks, which is the blue bars on the bottom. And it looks as though, the, the again, the solid blue are the ones, the numbers that we do know. The hatched number for 23 is currently a forecast. They're only partway through the marketing year. And of course, the red on the far right-hand side is really just all mathematical forecasting. So based on what we're looking at for 23 and 24 right now, it seems as though we're going to have a little bit of an inventory buildup, but in my opinion, again, not an excessive buildup. So it's not like there's going to be huge inventories that are building, but we're going to have a little bit larger margin for error coming into the 23 and, tw and the, re the rest of the 23 season and into the 24 season. So where does uh, canola produced in Canada? Not again, a big surprise, Saskatchewan, as well as moving into Alberta are those, are those core areas. So the darker the green, the more tons are produced. Um, it does give you an idea, a general idea of where the production zones are. Now, one of the things that we're watching very closely, of course, is the weather and the weather forecast. Uh, this is the Palmer Drought Index, which is a little bit different measurement of drought than we have here in the United States, where we use the, the, the Nebraska, University of Nebraska Drought Index. This is a little bit different way of measuring a drought, but it shows as though this is more measuring root zone uh, soil moisture. It does show that some of those core canola regions, in particular in, in north, northern and western Saskatchewan, as well as the eastern portion of of Alberta are in the dry conditions. We will be watching those relatively closely as we come into spring planting and the rest of the growing season. There is also some regions here in, in Manitoba that are relatively dry, but please realize that those are not really hardcore heavy canola producing regions, although they do produce some acreage. So what do we expect for planted acreage? Now this is again historically going back on saying, well, what do, what do the Canadian crop normally look at? The black line on top is canola and canola acreage. This only goes through 2023. I haven't added the 24 estimates yet because the, the I'm really waiting for the farmer-based surveys of what planted acreage is going to be rather than the mathematical forecasting that, that Stats Canada is putting out. The point I wanna make here is that for the last several years, canola plantings have been relatively stable. Now, wheat has come up over the last couple of years. We do expect a slight reduction in Canadian spring wheat plantings next year. Um, but And some of that will slip, I think, into the pulse crops. But there really hasn't been any substantial growth or expansion of canola plantings in Canada, even though we've had some relatively high prices. So again, this will be something I'll be watching very, very closely over the next couple of months to try and get a, a general read on what do we expect to happen. So let's come in back and kind of recap what we've learned so far and what does that mean for both old crop pricing and new crop pricing. So again, this is the futures market for the May canola contract. Now this is Canadian dollars per metric ton. So we have to do some conversion into US dollars per hundred weight, uh, which most of you should be able to do. And, and I can help you with that if you're really interested. 
What I really want you to do is follow that basic trend. So it looks as though we've put in kind of a low, at least a short-term low, late in, in February. Got a little bit of recovery coming now in March. Again, the real question we have is, is there enough momentum in the oilseed market in general, not just what's going on in canola, but the oilseed market in general to be able to lift us and push us through what I would consider a, a key um, resistance level at about 618. Okay, now that will be kind of a tricky thing to do. If we continue to have some lifting and some, some increase in prices in the soybean market and therefore the soybean oil market, we might be able to get through that point and then push into that area that would be maybe that 645 level. So we do have some upward potential, but I guess in my mind, this 618 is going to be kind of our first real test to see if there's enough momentum in the marketplace to be able to push us through that, that, that pricing point. My final graphic is actually for November canola. So this would be for harvest delivery. This would be the 2024 pricing level. And I just wanted to kind of flip flop back and forth between the old crop at about 610 versus new crop at 623. When you convert that into US dollars per 100 weight, that's a, not quite 50 cents a 100. 47 cents a hundred difference between the old crop price and the new crop price. So right now, in my view, that new crop price premium we've got is really for some uncertainty in the marketplace. If you notice the general trend lines, the general shape of these are relatively similar. And so what happens in the old crop market does spill over in a new crop market. Although if we have some issues this spring, we can start to see those separate a little bit. So with that, I need to be careful of my time. Um, I appreciate your time and attention. Again, if you do have questions, don't hesitate to uh, contact me and let me know if you want to, want to visit. Thank you very much.